All right, 8.1 polynomial functions. Uh, so we're going to start looking at what a polynomial function is, kind of breaking it down in the generic form, uh, and then begin to look at what we can recognize from those things. We've talked briefly before about polynomials uh, with those, but how to recognize those things, and what does the basic graph look like? Uh, can I pick out um, a, a graph based on just a few attributes of our polynomial function? Okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of do like I've done in some previous sections. I'm going to bring up uh, the definitions on a page uh, so that we don't have to write them out on the board, save a little bit of time there uh, on those pieces of the video. You're welcome to pause the video uh, and write those things down. Or if you're in my actual course, then go into the Canvas page uh, and you can print this as well. Okay. But let's bring that up here. So let me share my screen with you. All right, and so here we can see our definition. So our first one is a polynomial function. Uh, so a polynomial function is P of X. So that's our function notation. Uh, and then we have A sub N times X to the N power plus A sub N minus one times X to the N minus one power and so forth. And we work our way down until we get to A sub one times X to the one plus A sub zero. Now, we don't put x to the zero because the zero power means that we don't have any x's uh, for those. And so that's why we don't put that uh, there. Now, all that means, I know it looks ugly, but all that means is we have a coefficient. That's the a sub whatever. And then we have a power. And so they're just given the same subscript um, as the power to show that that's the coefficient that goes with that power. And that's it. So we can look at all kinds of different ones. So when we're talking about, talk about an x squared plus x plus three, that's a polynomial, just as we've talked about before. But this is just our generic version that says that we could have um, 35 x to the one millionth and then work our way down until we get two plus one. We don't have to have everything in the middle. We can have some, we can have nothing uh, with those pieces. Uh, we just work through those parts, okay? Now, by knowing those things, we can find some other pieces. So uh, we have what's called the leading term test. Um, and this gives the end behavior. What's happening at the end of my function, all right? Uh, and so we can see those things down below. Now, all we need to do for those is look at our leading term. We don't care what comes after our leading term. And remember, the leading term is what has the highest power on it uh, for those, okay? Now, if our power is even, so we have a square or a fourth power or a sixth power, that's our first two, part A and B on this, uh, these first examples, okay? And so we're looking here at those, let me annotate uh, for those. So I'm looking here, if N is even, then we have two possibilities, all right? So if my first part out here, the A sub N is, uh, positive, then both of my end behaviors go up. And if we remember a parabola, that's a square, and it does that, right? It looks like a parabola. Now, when we get into bigger powers, the reason why we leave this gap in the middle here is because we don't know exactly what's going on. There could be some big waves, all kinds of things. Uh, so we got to keep that open because we don't know exactly what it looks like right now. Okay, and we're not caring about the overall individual details. We're looking for just the end behavior at this point. Now, if the A uh, sub N or the coefficient is negative, then they both go down as we've talked about before. Okay, now what about it being odd? So if our power up here is odd, okay, then uh, they're gonna go different directions. Now, if it's positive, if my coefficient is positive, we go up as we move to left, right. And that is kind of linear. So if we think of a straight line, it goes up when we have positive slope. And it goes down when we have negative slope. Okay, so those things stay true with linear, which is a one power. Or a cubic or a fifth power, all of those things will remain the same. Okay. And so we'll be able to look at, look at those things. And just knowing those are gonna allow us to select graphs, or just draw a quick sketch of those things if we're just wanting to know what's going on basically, all right? And then our third definition is called multiplicity. 
Uh, the multiplicity is the number of times the same factor occurs. So if we were to have technically the same answer a bunch of times. So we'll look at that as well, right? So let's look at our examples and some things that we can pull from this um, and be able to work here with those, okay? Uh, for number one, uh, we want to look at this function, p of x equals negative 5x squared, or x, yeah, x squared, uh, plus 7x to the third, plus x to the fourth. And I want to find the following information. I want to find what is the uh, leading term. I want to find the leading coefficient the degree of the polynomial uh, and it's that's supposed to be a d there and it's classification I'll talk more on that when we get to it okay all right, so the leading term is always going to be uh, whichever one has the highest power on it, okay? And then the numbers with it. So we look at our powers, we have two, three, four. And so that means this x to the fourth, uh, since there's a one in front of it, we don't write that there. Uh, but our leading term here is x to the fourth, okay? So by identifying my leading term, I can start picking out other things. Well, my leading coefficient is the coefficient on this, which is a one. And the degree of the polynomial is going to be that power, which is four. Okay? So our degree is always going to be the power on that leading term. All right? Now, for our classifications, we actually have some different choices. Uh, so um, if you're using our Pearson group, you're going to have uh, a few different things here. You're going to have a constant, linear, quadratic, cubic, or quartic. Quartic. Okay. Now there may be other names. These are our typical ones. After this, we would just say. Uh, fifth power, sixth power for the most part. Uh, these are little smaller ones, and so um, they get names uh, for those, okay? Now, a constant, that just means that we have a number of some sort, okay? Linear means that we have x as our uh, leading term. Quadratic is x squared. Cubic is x to the third. Quartic is x to the fourth. And so when we look at our leading term, we can see that's x to the fourth. And so we would have a quartic for this function. Okay. Now, again, we haven't gotten into what we can do with it yet, but in our next few questions, we're start, gonna start uh, looking for these details in order to determine what the rest of it looks like, okay? So number two, we're gonna do just that, sketch, a graph, okay? All right, so let me erase part of this so that I have some room. So part A. So f of x equals negative x uh, to the sixth plus two x to the fifth minus seven x squared. All right, so we look for our uh, leading term. So here we can see that our leading term is going to be this negative x to the sixth. And a lot of times it is just that first one. We like to put things in descending powers, but it's not a guarantee. Look for that biggest power, okay? All right, so here when we look at this power up here, that's telling me that uh, we have 
um, and even. And so that means that my arrows, if we go back to uh, those notes and definitions, that my arrows are going to go the same direction. Okay, so either both my arrows are going to go up or both my arrows are going to go down uh, as we move from them, okay? Um, and then here, the negative tells me down, right? So if I were to draw a quick sketch of this, okay, I know nothing else about it, uh, and this is not a perfect sketch. This is just what may happen, okay? We do know that our graph is basically going to have uh, this shape to it. Now, there may be more wiggle in the middle with those, but for now, this is what we're going to put. Now, in your homework, if you're looking at Pearson there, what you would select, you'd have a couple things. You just may have uh, an area that has these pieces on it, okay? Just may have two arrows going down, much like of what you saw in the notes, the definitions, all right? So you would select that one. If they have physical graphs uh, with those that are doing different things, there is only going to be one that both of my end behaviors are going down. So that's the one you're going to select uh, for that, okay? Uh, so that's how you're going to look at that. You're just simply looking at the end behaviors, and your graphs will be different enough that you can see that they're going, both those are going at, off the end at the bottom uh, of your graph there for those, okay? And so that's how you would explain that problem for me. Uh, you would say uh, down in same direction uh, because of that leading term. All right. Uh, let's do another one. Say g of x equals x to the fifth plus 1 over 10x to the third minus 3. So again, here, uh, we're looking at the leading coefficient, uh, leading term, sorry. And so that's going to be the biggest power, which is x to the fifth. Now this time, this five here, uh, because it's odd, that tells me they're going to go different directions. One up and one down. We just got to figure which one is it. It's going to go... Um, down as we move left to right, or is it going to go up as we move left to right? Well, because this is positive here, that means that we're going to go up as uh, we move left to right, okay, uh, for those pieces. So let's look at what that graph may look like, okay? Uh, and so I kind of know some other things going on here. Uh, this minus three is going to be my y-intercept. So anytime you have a number at the end, that's kind of where the y-intercept is going to be. Uh, and so we're going to be doing something to this effect. Okay. Now, again, uh, it may do a lot more wave in the middle. We, I'm not sure. I'm not looking at that yet. Okay. I am looking for this and this on my graphs. Okay. Now, you may have, again, one that looks much like your definitions, uh, where it's just the pieces and there's a gap in the middle. Or if they have an actual graph, again, you only have one that will have it in this direction. With this end over here, the left-hand side goes downward, and the right-hand side goes upward. Okay? And so that's what you're going to identify on those pieces. So they're not going to make you physically graph them at this point. It's going to be a multiple choice type piece. Okay. All right. Number three. Um, R, two, and negative one zeros of f of x equals x to the fourth minus 6x to the third plus 8x squared plus 6x minus 9. Are they zeros? Now, zero means, if we think back to a previous uh, unit, that when we plug in our number, we do our work, 
and our answer is zero, then it's a zero. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to plug in uh, each one of these. So we're going to do here kind of part A is uh, f of two, we're plugging in two for x. And so we get two to the fourth minus six times two to the third plus eight times two squared plus six times two minus nine. And what does that equal? Okay. Now we can plug that in our calculators and work that out for those. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, and so we're going to get three. Well, that is not zero. So no, that is not a zero of the function. Okay. Now on an exam, I would expect to see exactly what I have on the board. I would expect to see at minimum. Now, if you want to work more of it out, that's fine. Uh, I have no problem with that. But I need to see you plugging in your numbers, getting the answer, and relating that to zero before you pick yes or no. Okay. Now, uh, if you anything less than that, I will not give you credit for work on those pieces. So please keep that in mind. All right, now what about f of negative one? So that is negative one to the fourth minus six times negative one to the third plus eight times negative one squared plus six times negative one minus nine. And you are gonna see that that does equal zero when we plug that in our calculator. So yes, this is a zero of the function. Now, we're going to learn later on those are important things. Uh, zero tells me some information. Uh, and so if I can pick out those zeros, that's going to let me do even more with my graph later on. So it's important right now just to be able to pick out those zeros. Okay. All right, number four. Find the zeros and state their multiplicity, okay? So part A, f of x equals x plus three squared times x minus one. All right, now the good thing in this particular problem is we are in factored form. Uh, and so we don't have to work real hard here in this one. Uh, in order to work this problem, we're just gonna take each one of those parentheses. So in order to find the zero, we say X plus three equals zero uh, and X minus one equals zero. And we solve, and those are going to be our zeros, okay? So let's do that, that means that X equals negative three and x equals positive one as our zeros. And I'm just gonna do a little chart down here, uh, my zeros and then their multiplicity. So we're gonna talk about that as well because that's part of our instructions. Uh, so we had negative three and we had positive one as our zeros, okay? Now the multiplicity is how many times those happen. Now we only worked them once, but we go back to the original problem and we see, and we'll notice up here that this has a two power on it. Well, that is actually its multiplicity. It means we have an X plus three and another X plus three. So we solved them individually. We, we would have gotten negative three twice. And so that means its multiplicity is two. Now the X minus one, there's only one of those. So that's its multiplicity. And so that's how we get that answer. For those, okay. All right, let's look at another one here. All right, g of x equals x to the third, it's supposed to be a three, uh, plus. 3x squared minus x minus 3. Right, now this time it's not in factor form. So we've got to factor this thing 
uh, to be able to see what our zeros are uh, for them because we don't have any other way of solving these because it's bigger than an x squared. So we need to uh, factor this out, okay? So if we remember, uh, we do have uh, factor by grouping. And so we can factor out an x squared here. Uh, we get x plus three. And then over here, we can factor out a negative one and get x plus three, which is good because we need those parentheses to be the same. We remember our factoring. So now we get x plus three times x squared minus one. Now because one of those has a power, it's not completely done. We want that down to its smallest piece. So I'm actually gonna factor it a little bit further. So we're gonna get x plus three for the first one. And that second one is a square minus a square. So we get x plus one times x minus one for that. And we do need to factor all the way out for those pieces, okay? Well, now we can set all those equals zero. So x plus three equals zero, x plus one equals zero, and x minus one equals zero. And so when we solve those, we see that we get x equals negative three, negative one, and positive one. So if I kind of do that chart there, again, our zeros, our multiplicity, we get negative three, negative one, positive one. Uh, and this time we go back to our parentheses here, each one has a one on it. So the multiplicity is one on every one of those. Okay? Now Pearson may set it up separately. They may not have a table like I did, but you'll be able to read through and figure out where is your zero needs to go and where does your multiplicity need to go for those, okay? All right, so those are the things that bring us into this new section and new chapter. So we're gonna utilize uh, this information to continue on and graph more specific in future sections.